voice of new life starts now. Good morning, and welcome to New Life Baptist Church. Trust your day is going better than those. <laughs> the month of June is here, and the corn and the beans are growing in the fields like crazy. Hopefully your flowers and your garden made it through the past couple of weeks of being extremely di- and dry, and thank God for the rain that we got this past week multiple times, depending on whether you got two tenths, three inches, or somewhere in between, and we praise God for that rain. As you stopped and maybe you looked out the window I did the other day, it was almost like when it first started raining, you could watch those plants soak that up almost immediately. And I trust that if you've come to study the Word of God today, that you've come to soak up the truth of God's Word and to grow in your understanding, your application of that together. Again, we're glad to have you this morning, whether that's here in person or online for those Uh, that are traveling today, Uh, we trust that they have safety wherever they are. But we as a church, we want you to know, we want you to be a part of who we are. We want you to grow in your walk with the Lord. We're not just here as a big social club. We're here to get serious about God because God is serious and he's serious to us. We want to grow together. We want to teach others how to know and to follow the Lord. We want to see people come to know Christ as a result of of interacting with the gospel message. We want to see people go on and live their lives for him. Because the old things have passed away, and the new is there in Christ Jesus. And we want to help people do that. I'm going to invite you to take your copy of the Word of God this morning for our scripture reading to the New Testament book of Romans. Romans chapter 16, as we continue our current sermon series entitled One Anothering. Yes, we are getting closer and closer to the end of this sermon series, and then we'll get on to a different one for the majority of this summer. But one anothering, Romans chapter 16 this morning, and we're going to look at verse 16 for our scripture reading. Romans 16 and verse 16. We've been looking at the one another's of scripture, and God's word lists 59 of them. All God's people should say amen when I tell you I'm not preaching 59 sermons on them. Some of them are repetitive in nature. They're mentioned more than once. But they show how God expects us, desires that we would behave, treat, respond to each other. And as I thought about this past week, these behaviors, these actions, they flow out of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Meaning that if my relationship with Jesus Christ is not what it ought to be, these one and others aren't going to be evidenced in the life that I'm living. What does the word of God say? For out of the heart, the mouth speaks. I would even dare say that what's in our hearts and our minds comes out in our actions as well as in our words. And if I'm not like Christ, if my relationship with him is not what it needs to be, the odds are the one and others are going to be very difficult for me to exemplify before others. This morning... Many of these one and others have been taught by the church in the Sunday pulpit, but few of them have the opportunity to be lived out with believers within the context of the local church because of the way that we set churches up. We as a church, we can be intentional about getting people stationed at posts and getting people here and getting people here, and we can be focused on getting people plugged into programs, delivering curriculum week after week after week. But I wonder, are we intentional about one anothering? Interacting with one another in the midst of those things. A very well-known pastor said it this way, the primary activity of the local church was and still is one anothering one another. We're to be one anothering one another everywhere that we go. And this morning we're going to continue to study the one another's of Scripture. We've looked at those, love, edify, encourage, pray, bear and care, forgive, admonish, be submissive, serve one another. And we're going to talk about greeting one another today. You're in Romans 16, let's look at this passage of Scripture. Romans 16, and you can follow along in verse 16 of your Bible or on the PowerPoint. It says this, greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. 
Maybe you're listening today and this is the first time you've ever heard the name of Jesus mentioned. The one and others start with Jesus Christ. It was because of another that you have been brought into a relationship and the possibility of having a relationship with the God of the universe that never existed prior. And it's not just that you can't know that God exists, it's that there is a whole different side of that relationship that Jesus Christ opened for you. He went to the cross, he died for your sin, he rose from the grave, and he stands there reaching out for you to accept him. By faith, in faith. Have you ever done that? God gave so much up for you because he loved you. The greatest of the one others is love. And we know God is love because God gave up his son. We're called to live in light of that. We're to love as God loves us. If you've never accepted Christ, can I encourage you to do that? Last Sunday morning, we looked at the believer's highest honor, serving one another. We began with some questions. How should being a servant of the Most High God affect the way that I serve? Why should we consider serving Christ the greatest honor possible? Every believer must understand that they're a servant of God who is called to serve by God himself. We looked at four reasons why serving God is such a great privilege for a believer. Number one, we get to understand our purpose in life through service. We get to follow the example of our Savior through serving. Number three, we get to serve God alongside angels and prophets and apostles. And reason number four, we kind of stopped on last week for a while. But we get to practice serving God for future and eternity. We closed our time with this challenge. May God help us to learn that serving him is a calling from him and a tremendous privilege to do alongside of one another. Romans 16 this morning is where we're going to be. Understand before I even get into my sermon this morning that I have never preached this passage before and I already know what some of you are thinking. How am I as the pastor going to preach 30 minutes on the verse, greet one another with a holy kiss. Anybody wondering that? I would also ask how many of you have read through this verse before and just simply glossed over it and never paid attention to it? Just pray for me, would you? Pray that God would use this message to convict your life as he has used it in my own as I've studied to get ready for today. Paul tells the church four times, the Romans, you can write this down, it's, it's in there, you can underline it, it's on your outline for you, but he tells the church four times, the Romans, the Corinthians, the Thessalonians, to greet one another with a holy kiss. So lest you think this is that one verse only in scripture, it's kind of the, the odd duck of the bunch, he says it to multiple churches. If you go to the other end of Scripture and you look at Peter's writings, Peter actually writes, greet one another with a kiss of love. If you want the Pauline version of that is, greet one another with a holy kiss. Peter just writes a little differently. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 14. In each instance, the Greek words denote a kiss, which is sacred, physically pure, morally blameless. And it was a common custom in most nations for people to kiss each other at a meeting or a party to display their love. Sincere affection and friendship for each other. The kiss is described as holy, and I want to be very careful in how I say this. It was holy to distinguish from that of a sexual kiss, as well as a hypocritical and a deceitful one, which we know that Judas gave Jesus. Now all of a sudden you're beginning to see there's a lot more to this that maybe you didn't realize. New Testament times. A holy kiss was a sign of greeting, much like the modern handshake. For Christians, it further expressed brotherly love and unity. This is something that I did not realize until I really dug into this. The holy kiss was especially precious to new believers during the early church years because they were often outcast from their own families because of their new faith. Their new faith pushed them away from their physical family and so the love and the affection and the kindness and concern that they would get from an earthly family was not present. But you know who was called to show that same kind of love and affection and sincerity were the people of God. 
in the church. These new believers gloried in their new spiritual kinship they'd found among Christians. Furthermore, the holy kiss from a Jewish Christian to a Gentile believer was evidence that Gentiles were fully accepted into the Christian fellowship. It was an acceptance. We know all about the problems that happened in the early church with the Jews' refusal of the Gentiles and how that had to be addressed. But it was a sign that though you be a Gentile, though you be a Jew, I accept you in Christ. And they would greet each other. It was done between Jewish and Gentile believers, and it was done righteously in recognition that all believers were brothers and sisters in the family of God. Whether or not the Holy Kiss should be a tradition we carry on today or not in Scripture is not really clear. Whether or not our salutations to brothers and sisters in Christ include the Holy Kiss, the important thing is this, that our greetings spring with real love and friendship, characterized by sincerity and represent true Christian fellowship. With all that in mind, we come to Romans 16 this morning. And Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And you're sitting here this morning and you go, what does it mean to greet one another with a holy kiss today? What does that look like in the church of God today? Not in Paul's day, not in Jesus' day. What does it look like today? Because the here and now for Christ is what matters. How do we do this as a church? How should we or do we greet one another in the body of Christ? We're going to look at that. And when we greet one another, the way that Paul instructs us to do here, whether it's here in Romans, in Corinthians, or in the Thessalonians, if we greet each other this way in the body of Christ, are we seeking to show genuine sincerity? You have some blanks on your outline this morning. Let me give you those. Every believer must understand that when we greet one another... It should convey genuine sincerity for them. If you get nothing else from my sermon this morning, I want that to stick with you. That when you greet another brother or sister in Christ, that you convey genuine sincerity for them. You ever met anybody fake? Cold fish handshake? They look at you and then look at someone else? Never make eye contact? Sincerity. Sincerity. This morning we're going to look at this verse in detail. And before we do that, I want to stop and ask the Lord to bless our time of study together in his word. So would you look to the Lord with me in prayer. Father, would you quiet our hearts before you? Father, be with the message that you've laid upon my heart. Give me clarity of thought this morning to say no more and no less than I should. That we would be able to take this verse of scripture this morning which was written to the church that is for the church regarding the way that we respond to one another and that we would own it, that we would accept it as God's word to each one of us. It's not just for somebody else, it's for me. Father, go before our time, hide me behind the cross and help us as a church to do a better job of greeting one another in the body of Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever attended a church and did not feel welcome? Anybody ever been there? Boy, is that awkward. As a pastor, I have had the privilege of visiting other churches. And there was one particular church that I visited, and the only person that came up to me and greeted me was the pastor. And it felt very awkward to see people standing there looking at you Hey, who's this weird new guy? We don't recognize him. You go talk to him. No, you go talk to him. Pastor will talk to him. And it makes you feel uncomfortable to even be there. Church, I understand and I say this in love this morning. Churches should never be that way. Ever. If you go into a church like that, you greet them. You walk up to the people that don't greet you and you greet them. Because God never intended for his church to look like that. In fact, a church that fails to greet people and make them feel welcome is a church that's outside of God's design for the church because God designed us to greet people. The sermon is a reminder that our churches are meant to be places of warmth and worship for people who need and want Christ. People should know that when they come into a church, 
which is the meeting place, because we as people are the church. You understand what I mean? The people, the church, genuinely care. They love. They want to help them. They want to be there for them. And so let me ask you this morning as we begin, which of these two people are you? Don't look at the person sitting next to you, behind you, in front of you, just you. Which of these two people are you? Are you the person who likes to talk to everyone? You could talk to them about something that happened 60 years ago like it was today. You could talk to anyone. And then there are some of you that I would guess are more like the people who avoid interacting with people unless you absolutely have to interact with them, right? The extrovert and the introvert in the body of Christ. Can I tell you this morning, whether you can talk to everybody or you don't want to talk to anybody, you should fall somewhere in the middle. Because God has asked all of us in his word to do this. I remember as a pastor's kid, this is a while ago now, but we had a rule in growing up that if you got in trouble for whatever the reason, and I don't know what the particular occasion was, if you got in trouble, you had to stand with mom and dad at the front door of the church as people would exit after the service. And I remember on a couple particular occasions, and I don't know all the details, I ended up finding myself there. And I remember standing next to my mom and dad as people would come out and they would, they would greet people, you know, and talk to them as, as they were leaving after the service was over. I remember I really did not like that, to be honest. I'll be honest. Honesty is a good thing, right? I did not like standing there. Hi. There were people that you wanted to see, right? Your friends. The people that you latched onto. Hi. It's good to see you. I'm glad you're here today. And then there were the people that you prayed and you hoped would exit through an alternate door at church. Anybody like that? Whether we want to be honest enough and admit it, there are people like that. We don't want to interact with them. We avoid it. And now I look at where I am as a pastor, my, how the tables have turned. Now I have to talk, and I choose to talk to anyone and everyone that I get the opportunity to. And maybe you're like that. Maybe you're one of those that doesn't like to talk to people. Or maybe you're the kind of person that talks to everybody. Being a pastor's kid, being a third generation pastor who had a grandpa who was a pastor, a dad who's a pastor, and now myself. I remember every year we would go to the Iowa State uh, IAR Association of Regular Baptist Churches State Conference. And it's a problem when your dad and your grandpa are very well known around the state and you go to something like that. We as kids, we'd always want to go back to the hotel after the evening session because the hotel would always have a nice pool and we wanted to swim, Right? But you know how hard it is to get two pastors to leave so you can go do that? Oh, hi, how are you? And it's like you, you're just kind of pulling them toward the door and they're greeting everybody on the way. If you're a pastor's kid this morning, you understand what I'm saying. Paul writes, greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. And I want to deal with this passage this morning a little bit differently than probably even what you're thinking. I want to deal with it with the questions that Paul addresses. The questions that Paul addresses, the questions that you're thinking, what does it mean to greet one another with a holy kiss? What is this about? So let's jump into these questions and see what God's word has to say. Question number one, what does Paul mean by this one another command? There are some commands that Paul gives that are really straightforward, right? Like the one we looked at last week, serve one another. It's pretty straightforward. Love one another. Pretty straightforward. What in the world does he mean when he says, greet one another with a holy kiss? So Paul gives them some instructions. And this is where we're going to break this apart this morning. Instruction number one. Paul wanted them to understand this carefully. Instruction number one. You greet them. Notice the text of scripture. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And you're going... Who? Me? Yes, you. You. It's an imperative. It's something that you and I are to do. And so let's just say that this isn't for me, that this isn't me, 
It's for somebody else. The answer is, if you're the one reading it, it's for you. If you're a child of God, it's for you. If you attend a church, it's you. You greet them. Some of you are like, if we could just say, you greet one another and put a period there, I'd be fine with that, right? Because some of us, our greetings would be like this. I can wave at somebody from afar. You greet them. There's an understood imperative here. Greet is an active compound verb. In other words, it implies to you. You're the one to take the initiative. Note that you are not to wait till others greet you. Paul literally says, if you're a you, you go greet them. If you're thinking, should I greet them? Should I not go greet them? You go greet them. That's what Paul says. Sometimes people come to church and they hunker down in their seats and they wait for someone to come and to greet them. And I've learned this as being a pastor. Some people bring a lot of stuff into church because they want to overwhelm you with their pew. They bring in their Bible. They bring in the bags. They bring in all this stuff and they just kind of spread it out because they're afraid somebody will come talk to them if they don't have enough stuff there. Oh, it looks like they're busy doing something. Many a person has found Jesus Christ because somebody greeted them in the name of Christ. Many an individual has continued to keep coming to church simply because somebody took initiative and greeted them. We're told to greet them. And if you're one of those people that says, well, I'll wait for them to come and greet me, it'll never happen. There's somebody that, that's new to church. I'll wait till they come over and talk to me. They'll never be back. Paul says, you take the initiative. You be the one to go greet another. The word initiative, for those that don't know, the word initiative, as a good friend of mine puts it, is this. You see the need, you go meet the need. And in this case, if you see the person that isn't greeted, go greet them. And that's what Paul's emphasizing. If you see someone who hasn't been greeted, don't wait for somebody else to tell you to go greet them. There was a pastor who literally had to go up to his members in his church and say, you need to go greet that person. Can you imagine being that pastor, let alone being the one to hear that? Take the initiative, Paul says. Go greet people. And sometimes people attend or join a church and they never quite fit in. They're waiting for others to be friendly with them. They're waiting for somebody to come and to greet them. Proverbs 18.24 says it's the other way around. A man who has friends must show himself friendly. If you have no friends in church, can I ask you, have you ever greeted anybody? Do you really know anybody in your church? The best way to make friends when you join a church is for you to invite people over, for you to get to know people, for you to talk to them, for you to invite them out for a meal together. It isn't someone else's job in the church to greet people, it's yours. Well, I'll wait till they greet them. No, you go greet them. Now, you realize, of course, that there are some people who expect or even demand the attention of others, right? Luke chapter 11, Jesus discusses the Pharisees who always seem to get it wrong. Describing them, Jesus says this, they walk around the marketplace all dressed up in their fine robes, they look so dignified, and they expect a greeting. And they did. And you see, there are some people who seem to say, well, here I am, everybody noticed me, and then there are others who seem to be saying by their spirit and their attitude, there you are, I've noticed you. The Pharisees were the here I am people, and Jesus says, and was, a there you are person. He was concerned about people. Matthew 5, Jesus says, don't just love those, love your own or love those that love you or are nice to you. Why even the pagans and the tax collectors do that? And then James says this, never show partiality. When the rich come, don't give them the best seats in the house. Treat everybody the same. He was stressing that they were to be impartial. James even went so far as to say, if you show partiality to people, you're sinning. I won't ask this. I just want you to think about it, though. Is there anybody that you haven't greeted for a particular reason? So often, we are not the kind of people like our Savior that say, there you are, I'm going to come talk to you. You realize that many of the people that Jesus interacted with in his life while here on earth, he went to the people, the people didn't come to him. 
People that were lame that could not get up, Jesus went to. He interacted with them. A second instruction. So you're to greet them. Let's look at the latter part of this. He tells them how they were to greet them. Greet them with a holy kiss, right? Greet them with a holy kiss. Understand this is God's word, this isn't mine. If it was me, I would put something in our modern day vernacular that's a little less, whoa. But you know why it's odd for us? Because we don't live in a Middle Eastern type culture. When you look at this, some of you tough soldiers are getting the heebie-jeebies right now. You're going, now wait a minute, pastor, I ain't kissing nobody except my spouse and my kids at church or otherwise. And I, for one, would say, praise God for that. Okay? However, that isn't what I'm going to encourage you to necessarily do. But you need to understand that what is discussed in the text is cultural and there's a practical implication for today. And when we look at Scripture, it's good to understand not only cultural but also historical settings. There's both a cultural and historical side of what Paul is telling the Roman church to do. So don't get all worked up just yet, okay? Listen carefully. A holy kiss was the normal way to greet a person of the same sex in Paul's day, and it's still practiced in many cultures today. If you need examples, the Jews, the Arabs, the Persians, they still greet each other this way. But I want you to notice the clarifier word. We call this an adjective. It describes what's taking place. So if we just get rid of the phrase, and it just, the one another, and it just says, greet, greet, or I'm sorry, the, the, specifics with a if you get rid of that it just says greet one another with a kiss and all of a sudden we're really uncomfortable right but it's described for a reason he says to greet one another with a holy kiss the word holy means that there are no sexual overtones of any kind in this greeting it's a side peck on the cheek in most cultures so lest you blow this out of proportion and say Paul is teaching some weird far out doctrine. No, he's not. He's talking about something that would happen culturally. Second, what Paul and Peter are making plain here is to stress that the ordinary kiss and it's just an ordinary kiss be made holy by the Christian church rather than being abandoned. So what he's saying is this. This is a common cultural practice. So instead of just simply throwing the baby out with the bathwater, he says do it, but do it in a different way for a different reason. Notice what he says here. He says a holy kiss. Kissing is not uniquely Christian. Kissing this particular way was not uniquely Christian. It was a cultural thing. And what he says to them is this. The apostles do is this. Take the world, take it from the world, and he says, sanctify it. The word holy means sanctified. It means set apart unto something for a particular reason, for a particular purpose. Paul says, set your greeting aside for a particular purpose for the Lord. Similar to what he told Timothy, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8, and I don't have time to break all this down, but he says, I had asked that men everywhere pray, lifting up holy hands. Well, I've never met a man that had holy hands except my Savior, so this is a really odd thing. What does he mean? He's talking about how the hands were set apart unto worship of God. The same way as this kiss that he's talking about here on behalf of the Roman church was set apart unto God. It's for a particular reason. When the kiss of affection is given to a brother in Christ, it isn't sensual, it's not manipulative, it's not offensive, it's not hypocritical or in any way pretending to express affection that is not really there. Meaning this, if you went up to somebody in Jesus' day and you greeted them in anything less than a genuine, specific, holistic greeting, you were lying. Now, think about this today. We shake a lot of people's hands, right? Hi, I'm glad you're here today. Liar. I think it's even more surprising because when I read through the Gospels and it says that Judas kissed Jesus, 
it really kind of bites because I wonder sometimes how many Christians greet one another in the name of Christ and never mean it. You stop and you think about it. Maybe you have never thought about it this deeply this morning. You ever had a secret handshake that you and a friend did in high school? You know, you had some weird thing that you did and you bumped elbows or whatever. You ever have that? We did that as kids and I still don't remember how that went. But you and your friend, you had that special greeting that you would do to each other and nobody else could figure it out. It was unique and it was a way of showing just how good of friends you were. Think of all the ways that we greet each other today. There's handshakes. For some of you, there's hugs, and I could go down that list. So I think the apostles would want us to be encouraged today to use various culturally appropriate symbols of greeting. Because again, we're not in that culture. We have our own culture. We have our own cultural norms. If you start walking up to people and kissing them on the side of the cheek, you're going to break a lot of cultural norms. Amen? That was really weak. Let's try that again. If you start walking up to people and kissing them on the side of the cheek, you're going to get a lot of weird cultural norms broken. And we should say amen to that. That's not the way we greet people. So what are the culturally appropriate symbols of greeting today? And I would say this. How do we sanctify them? How do we make them holy for the Lord? What do we do? We ball up our fist and we fist bump each other, right? I've seen this in church. Maybe you elbow bump each other. All right, now think about this for just a minute. I hardly ever know what to do when somebody makes a fist. Somebody makes a fist at me and my first thought is, don't punch me, okay? Maybe that's not the first thing that you think of. But I think Paul would look at it this way and he would say this, I encourage all of you, to do whatever that culturally normal thing is that you do to greet each other and to sanctify it as unto the Lord. The culturally appropriate means of showing brotherhood or camaraderie or affection, make those things holy. Paul isn't mandating a certain style of greeting here and all those people should say amen again. Cultural greeting someone on the side of the cheek is not something that he says verbatim, you must do this. His emphasis is not on the form of greeting, but that it be holy, that it be sincere in greeting. He's teaching that we should greet people without partiality, sincerely, heartfelt. So in our culture, I can say this morning confidently, a hearty handshake that emphasizes that I'm sincerely glad for you and appreciative of you is sufficient. And all of you just wipe the sweat off your brow. We're to greet one another in the name of Christ. Now imagine this for just a moment. Look at the latter part of verse 16. The churches of Christ greet you. How many of you would like to go to a church fellowship with a couple other various churches and have everybody kissing the side of everybody's cheek? Whoa, that would be very awkward, wouldn't it? You know, you don't think about that today when you walk into a rather large gathering of churches and everybody's shaking hands. People that know each other are giving each other a hug. There's nothing wrong with that. Since when as the church have we lost what it means to be in Christ together? I want to ask you, a second question. I want you to think this through with me. What happens with one another when we greet each other in this way? See, we have to understand why we greet each other, what it looks like, how it works, but what, what is the result of this when we greet each other this way? Verse 16 is actually the culmination of a passage where Paul demonstrated sincere, heartfelt greetings which actually involve no physical contact at all. In fact, in verses 3 through 15, he details this. In fact, Paul uses the word greet 16 separate times. Greeting by name 26 specific individuals or groups. So Paul shows us how to greet one another by example. And there's three positive things that we can take away. Results, if you will. I like Romans chapter 16. Enough that I named my daughter after Romans 16. The church that met in Phoebe's house. 
And I want to walk through this passage this morning, and I want to show you how the greeting affected what took place in the church. There were some things that came about when they greeted one another this way. Number one, the positive result of when you greet somebody like this is you acknowledge them. You acknowledge them. When you greet people sincerely and generously, you acknowledge them. Look at verses 3 through 7. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who, for my life, risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Also greet the church in their house. Greet my beloved um, Epontus, or Eponidas, uh, who is the first convert in Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who worked hard for us. Greet Andricus and Junia, my fellow Jews and fellow prisoners, who well known among the apostles are, who also were in Christ before me. Greetings and greetings. And if you keep reading, there's more greetings. In studying this passage, I learned that about half the people in this list are either slaves or women, which is even more interesting. People who had very little influence or power in that day. So Paul isn't just name dropping. Yeah, these are the important people you should greet. He's not saying, here are all these important people that I know. Greet them. You know, it's really interesting that in a long line of people at a large event, you never get greeted by the dignitaries. These are people who were not really well known. And he's saying, these are common, ordinary people He's saying, by example, make them feel welcome. Reach out to them. And that's exactly what the church should be doing. Maybe more now than any other time in the history of the church, we're living in a society where the family has experienced dramatic changes. The average family was once defined as a husband and wife with two and a half children. I don't know where they get the half child. Who lived in a house in the suburbs with a white picket fence and would grow hamburgers in their backyard every Saturday afternoon. That was a family at one time. But today... The family dynamic has changed. There are a lot of single parents with children. In our transient society, families often move from one city to another, even more in military families. And when people move into a new community and a new job and a new neighborhood, they find it hard to find community and fellowship and people to interact with. They go to work and they make some friends there. And it's kind of a dog-eat-dog world. And fellow workers don't always share the same values or likes. But then they come to church. And what do they find? What should they find? What do they hope to find? They walk in the door of the church. Is it going to be any different than any other church that we've ever been in? Some churches are very exclusive. Some are very self-centered. Folks just talking to people they know and... Paul says, that's not what I want you doing. Can I say this morning carefully and graciously that if there was any other place on earth that should be welcoming and friendly to somebody who's a guest, it ought to be the local church. A place that is God-centered first and foremost and others-centered second, meaning you came for the purpose of worshiping God, but there are others that came to worship God as well. When you come to church, it's easy just to talk to the people that you know well and share the same interests. But the Bible teaches us that we're not to show partiality. We're to be open to all, even those who are strangers. Then I ask a really pointed question. Do you think our church is warm, friendly, and welcoming? When people visit our church, what do you think their impression is? Do we seem to be saying, there you are. We're glad to have you here. We hope that you come again and again and again. We want you here. We want to, we want to latch on to you. You're special. Not only in God's sight, but in ours. We care about you and your family. Whether that's the way we're perceived or not depends on the degree to which all of us at New Life Baptist Church greet one another. Those who are lonely, those that are struggling, greet them with sincerity. It's not just the job of a door greeter, an usher, a pastor, and his wife to greet people. It's all of our responsibility. We're to greet one another, not just our friends. Anybody have friends in church? 
I hope so. If not, I don't know what you call them. But you have friends. And you have people that are closer friends than others. And you know what? That's fine. Jesus had some that were as well. But you know what? That doesn't mean that Jesus ignored the rest of the disciples. He still talked. He still interacted with them. Can I ask you, what do you do with the people who are not in your ordinary group of close friends in church? Do you still greet them? You see, a greeting one another is more than a handshake. It's looking at someone and saying, in my book, you count. You're worth something. I'd like to spend more time with you to get to know you. It's acknowledging people. Paul says, acknowledge these people because they're worth acknowledging. Keep going. Number two, a second result. You commend them. The second one, we greet one another in the way that Paul teaches. We commend people. Look at the beginning. I read these verses. I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is the servant of Christ, which is in Sancria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you assist her in whatever she needs, for she has been a helper of many, myself included. What is Paul doing? He's commending Phoebe's character and testimony. Notice what he says. She's our sister in the Lord. She's a servant of the church. She's helped a lot of people, even me, so I commend her to you. Paul is showing respect for her. He's honoring her. He's edifying her. He's building her up. We have the power with our words to either enhance or to hurt. And notice that Paul's commendation of her is open and public praise. Some people think that if we honor and we lift up another believer on this earth, we're robbing God of his glory. That's hardly the case. If you faithfully train your children, you teach them good behavior, you impart to them respect and good habits, believe me, people will notice. So suppose someone says to you, your children are so well respected and and so well behaved, and you're going to say, no, that's not me, that's all God, right? How many of you do that? Didn't think so. What would your response be? Would you get in a hub and say, I beg your pardon? Don't you give credit to them or me? You give it to God. Okay, wow, lady. What are you talking about? Now you'd say it was me and my spouse who worked night and day to instill and train these children to live in a respectable way. You know who gets the glory for that? God does. Sometimes I think when we commend people publicly, we feel as though we're taking away from God. And can I just say it this way? When we publicly honor people for their godly deeds and their character which they've done for God, God beams with pride in his handiwork and he receives the glory for that person being honored and recognized because it's God at work in them. A third, very quickly, a third result is this. You express affection. Notice again verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss and don't get sidetracked again by the kissing part. As I said, a kiss was common and it was an accepted greeting in that day and culture. The way men and women shake hands today or women often hug each other and sometimes with big things, and I say really big things because it doesn't happen a lot, men will bear hug another guy. When my dad left the other day, he gave me a bear hug. My dad and I don't hug each other. It's a big deal. You know what? There's nothing wrong with greeting people. Notice that no matter how comfortable we feel, the giving needs to be heartfelt. The greeting needs to be heartfelt. And I would even say it this way. The reason why it is heartfelt is because human touch is involved. You think about how we can do a better job of greeting one another in the body of Christ. We should be reminded that Jesus understood the impact of how we see, receive, and interact with people. It speaks volumes about our relationship with God. But he understood something. The impact of human touch is still something today that works. A smile, a handshake, a hug speaks volumes in the body of Christ. Just as the lack of a handshake, the lack of a greeting, the refusal to give a hug speaks volumes. Think about Jesus for just a moment. Jesus ministered to untouchables. Nobody in those days touched a leper. Jesus did. If I put a leper in front of you today, none of you would touch him. Why? Boundaries, right? Jesus said to the people trying to hold the children back, he said, let them come to me 
And children in those days were treated very harshly. Nobody cared about children. Jesus did. And he greeted those children. He talked to those children. He interacted with those children. Oh, and then lest we miss this, he even reached out to his tax collectors, his IRS agents, and he greeted them. I wonder in our society today, who needs to be greeted in the name of Jesus Christ? Addicts, prostitutes, the poor, the needy, those who yearn for human touch where there is none, something that is different than selfish and sinful motivations, something that they seldom ever receive from anybody and should receive from a Christian who loves God. We need to, con- we need to be concerned that we express in holy ways our love and concern for other people. You say this morning, what can we take away? Some of you are going, I'm going to take away that I heard my pastor preach greet one another with a holy kiss for more than 30 minutes. But I want you to take something away that you could practice. The practical application. And I want to give it to you in a couple challenges. Challenge number one, whether you have a title or not, greet people in your church every single week. I don't mean being a greeter at a door or being on an organized schedule, even though that would be wonderful. But be the one who greets one another every Sunday informally and friendly on your own. And I want to challenge you not just to come to church, plop down to see, wait to be ministered to by others, come to church every Sunday with the intention of ministering, serving, and then leaving. Come in to minister. Come in and say to yourself, and you may have to start Saturday night, okay, tomorrow, it's going to take all my effort, but I'm going to talk to somebody. Good. Purpose now before the event ever happens. There's actually biblical principles for that. Purpose now to greet somebody next Sunday. Say, I'm going to greet somebody that I haven't greeted and talk to them and show I'm genuinely concerned. Can you do that? Come in, put your Bible down, put your coat away. I don't know why you'd need a coat in July. But set your stuff down and find someone. It'd be better to have to start five minutes late for church because people are greeting everyone than it would to have silence. Invite, encourage, welcome every visitor that comes in. Somebody else is talking to them, wait your turn. Then go greet them. And I would say it this way, God has commanded you as his child to greet one another. Will you obey? A second challenge, show impartiality as you greet one another. One of the most dangerous things in every church that I have ever pastored is the problem that exists with cliques. Every church can become clicky. These people talk to these people. These people don't talk to these people. Talk to everyone. Greet everyone in the name of Christ. But you don't understand. I I don't do well talking to people outside of my little circle of friends. Good. Figure out how. There were two really good friends in church who were literally inseparable. Many would tease them and say they're joined at the hip because they did everything together and that was good until one day someone said, you know, you guys are kind of cliquish. And these two Christians who didn't see it said to themselves, we don't want to be that way. And they wanted to be inclusive and welcome him, so they made a pact between themselves that every Sunday at church they would cordially greet one another and they would move on. And until they had visited every other person that was there, they would not come back and talk to each other. And the entire church benefited from that. You know, there are people that aren't really well known. They're shy. They're prone to being lonely. They're discouraged. They're downhearted. And they may need your handshake, your smile, your words of encouragement on a Sunday. And if you don't give that to them, you've missed out on an opportunity to minister. Case in point, let me ask it this way. Who do you greet first and who is the last person you would greet in church? And if you don't greet them the same 
way, can I just warn you there's some impartiality there? You say, well, pastor, that's not fair. You're the first one in the door. Okay. Aside from me, who else do you agree? And maybe this morning you don't know Christ. And he's knocking on the door of your heart and life. And he's saying, I want to come in. I want to be a part of that. Can I encourage you? Open the door and greet Christ for the first time. Jesus said, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, can I encourage you today before you leave to greet him in that way? Greet him as, I want you to be my Savior. We need to close. May God help us to learn from his word and the testimony of the early church and the importance that greeting one another has within the body of believers. Would you greet one another? Might not be with a holy kiss, but maybe a handshake, a hug, a smile that says, you're here and I care and I want you to know that. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. Father, I'm thankful for the privilege to preach this morning. Father, I don't know how you're using this particular sermon this morning. It is your word and your word accomplishes its intended purposes in our lives. Father, I I trust that you have worked through the Spirit, that you have used your word this morning to speak to hearts and minds. Father, all of us can do a better job of greeting one another. Might we do so in a way that conveys genuine love and sincerity and appreciation and acknowledgement and commendation for each and every one around us. Father, it's so easy when we come into churches to greet some but not strive to greet all. Might there be Sundays where we go home and we're we're honestly almost more upset that we didn't get to greet everybody? Might it be the desire of our lives to greet each and every one, to interact with, to get to know the people that God has placed in our local church? They're here because God has placed them here. They're here because God wants us to minister to them. And Father, forgive us for the times where we have not reached out and greeted someone. And we know that there was probably someone here that day that needed that encouragement. They needed that smile, that hug, that handshake that we would have given because they were discouraged, they were lonely, they were disheartened. Father, might we understand the importance in the body of Christ of greeting one another in a manner that brings you glory. Father, thank you for the privilege we've had to study your word. Dismiss us this day with your blessing. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. If it was a blessing, would you consider liking it and subscribing to our channel? And don't forget to hit that bell icon. Thanks for watching.